I personally, I don't think I actually met anyone who was truly a believer. I, I, I don't think I did. I mean, I knew that certain people said things that they had to say, for instance, in school. Well, maybe my history teacher in, in high school was indeed a believer. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, it, it wasn't like in, in, say, East Germany, where there were people, you know, reporting on each other. I never had that experience. It's not the case that the generation of my parents didn't have that experience, because after the war, things were definitely much worse. But I lived in Poland through this last uh, part of the regime when it was not really, I, I don't think people really believed in it. Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Today, I am really excited to have on the show Magda Strowinska for her new book, My Life in Propaganda, a memoir about language in totalitarian regimes. Magda has been a professor of linguistics in German at McMaster University since 1988. Her major areas of research and publication include sociolinguistics, analysis of discourse and cross-cultural issues, and pragmatics and cognition, Magda, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you for, oh, thank for inviting me to the show. Absolutely. Uh, and I was we were talking just before we went on. I'm so excited to have you on because I was a linguistics undergraduate uh, at, uh, at Indiana University. And you're my first linguist that I've, I've had on the show. We're I'm talking about the internet. What's that? <laughs> I'm surprised that I'm the first linguist that, that you have on the show because uh, just like yourself, linguists go in very different directions uh, after yeah. they finish uh, university. So, Well, and, you know, we'll, we'll get into this, too, later, later in the show. But uh, language in war and propaganda in war and um, you know, you're, you're not the first person to come on and, and talk about propaganda. I had an excellent guest on talking about the uh, the Russia Ukraine conflict in the way that the Russia is 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 using propaganda. So hot topic, but it's it's really great to have a uh, a linguistics PhD uh, joining me. But Magda, the the first question that I like uh, my guests to to answer when they come on the show is if in your own words, can you just say what is your book about? My book started as an academic attempt to talk about uh, propaganda in communist countries and in the Nazi Germany. But uh, very quickly, I, I cannot say I discovered, but I've noticed after 2001 that a lot of things that I thought about communist propaganda or totalitarian propaganda were not gone with the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall. And uh, it became very difficult to continue my project as a purely academic project. And this is why it became more a memoir of my own growing up with communist propaganda. So this academic project became a personal memoir because I thought that it was easier to write about my own uh, experience with propaganda rather than, uh, than trying to justify why propaganda in democratic countries became so much like propaganda that I experienced growing up in communist Poland. Oh, I'm so glad that, that you did make this more of a, a personal story, um, because as somebody who's read several um, academic linguistics books, um, often they can be, I don't want to say they can be dry, but your book certainly added a lot of color to some of the things that are, are studied more academically i was trying to do this but i'm very happy that you think that that, that yeah. that's how you read it yeah absolutely well let's talk about your family and your your upbringing um so you mentioned that you you grew up in uh, communist poland but could you just tell us a little bit about your childhood uh in the era that you grew up in 
my parents were relatively old as 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 parents uh, although these days that's probably not what we would think but because they were much older than regular parents they didn't really do very much with me and uh, this is why i spent my childhood either alone or reading books and uh, there were lots of adults in my life and uh, when they talked they talked about their adult uh, issues and historical issues and i was an avid listener to those conversations i was just talking to my daughter today that i don't really remember my parents ever telling me anything in the format of a lecture about history but it was the everyday life that brought lessons about history so for instance there was a picture on the wall of my father's first wife and his two sons from that first marriage so i was obviously interested in well what happened to my father's first wife and this is how i learned about the uh, ribbentrop molotov pact that divided poland in september 1939 and how my father's first wife and uh, the two half brothers i had were deported to russia where she died and they found their way back to Poland, one by being adopted by Russians, the other with the Polish uh, army of General Anders going through Persia to Scotland. So those were... And just to situate the the listener a little bit, so this is uh, 1960s uh, Poland? This is post-World War II? When I was growing up, it was the 19... I mean, I was born in the late 1950s, but my earliest memories go to 1960. And obviously, those uh, personal uh, family histories were not something that anybody could read about in the newspapers or learn about at school, because those were topics that were not covered. So as, as I say in the book, the ribbentrop molotov pact was as secret when I was growing up as it was in 1939. And uh, people were not uh, supposed to talk about it. They it, it was assumed that if nobody talks about it in the media, then people won't know about it. But obviously, every family was uh, was touched by the war. And the fact that it wasn't just the war with Germany, but also the the invasion in the East by the Soviet Union. So everybody really knew about it. It was just that my parents, being much older, they never modified their conversations because I was listening. And I just absorbed history lessons by by watching my family's history. Well, what... You know, so here, so I, I'm right outside of Washington, D.C. in America, and I've learned when I was a kid, I we learned that America won World War II for everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm curious what, when you were a girl, what did you know about World War II? Well, I knew a lot about what was happening during the war in my native Warsaw, because when I was growing up, I was still surrounded by ruins. I mean, not uh, like in 1945, but there were still ruins. And everywhere you went, there were there were some forms of monuments, commemorating people who were killed in the streets of Warsaw. So that's what I knew. I knew about my father's history because uh, his family came from uh, what used to be Eastern Poland and is now Ukraine. My mother's family was from Warsaw. So there were the uh, there was the history of the uh, Soviet occupation of Eastern Poland. There was the history of the war in Warsaw. My mother's brother was taken as a prisoner of war by the Germans and spent the whole war in an offlag in Germany. So all this, as I as I said, was just absorbed by what people were talking about. And uh, when I was learning about the war in school, it was mostly that it was the glorious Soviet army that, that won the war. 
and Americans were hardly ever mentioned. So uh, there was a history that you learned in school and there was history that you were told at home and they were they were two different histories and it kind of didn't bother me at all that uh, I knew those two histories and I knew that what I'm being told at school was at best an incomplete version of the event. And isn't that so, that's so interesting? That's a lie. Isn't that so interesting too that so when like I you know when I was growing up um I was taught that America won the war hardly any mention of the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. But I mean if you look at the numbers I mean you know my god like this the 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 casualties on the Soviet side and in the German side, like that, that's where most of the, the fighting happened. But it's so interesting that we're taught these, these different histories. It's, it's very interesting that you say this because it just shows that we are all told a certain version of the events that is for whatever reason convenient at a time. And it took me a very long time to actually realize that both sides use some version of propaganda. I yeah. assume that because one side is using propaganda, then the other side must be telling the truth. But the uh, world is more complicated than that. When's the first time you remember seeing something as, as a child and realizing, oh, maybe that's not true? Maybe this is propaganda that I'm being told or reading in the newspaper or seeing on TV. I don't know when I first realized that something was untrue. I I remember thinking, because I, I used to be told that, you know, uh, at school, not at home, that America is the enemy, that uh, obviously the life in America is terrible and that people suffer and uh, that the working class has to go on strikes, etc., etc., and uh, I write about this in the book that I corresponded with with an American girl. We were pen pals, and she sent me some gifts. And those gifts were so beautiful, and they were colorful, and they were packaged in colorful wrapping paper. And I think it was the aesthetics of the West that was so different than the aesthetics of communist reality that was really ugly and gray. And and, uh, if one wanted to design it badly, it would probably be better than than what, what we had around us. So I think that was the first moment when I thought, well, the country that can take care of the aesthetics of everyday things cannot be so bad. And uh, the fact that everything around me was so ugly, it, it meant that it wasn't true that the regime really cared about the people. Yeah. Well, that's a very naive, naive version from child's perspective. But this, this aesthetic aspect of communism is something that I really always thought about. And uh, I I had aspirations to become a graphic designer because my dream was when I was growing up uh, was not to be an artist, but to design things to make the world less ugly. And I naively thought that if you design things more beautifully, people will be better. I still believe that aesthetics is important in life. But that was obviously a very naive version of it. <laughs> well, well, I won't, I won't, I won't begrudge ten-year-old you know, Magda for for <laughs> wanting to change the world through beautiful things. Let's let's talk about propaganda itself, which you actually you you define as language manipulation. Actually, so you you write that a person who has experienced language manipulations, whether at a personal level, having been cheated or lied to in a vicious way, will never be able to trust words again. First, what what is language manipulation? And then talk a little bit about what you mean there. I think propaganda is 
more than language manipulation also manipulates facts and you don't necessarily have to manipulate language to lie but uh, I think it's not my discovery. Many people said the same, Klemperer, Orwell, or Hayek. They all said that the best way to manipulate people's views is by twisting word meanings. We believe that we know what words mean, and uh, we rely on those established meanings. But it's quite easy to manipulate meanings. I usually give to my students the example of the word fun, and we are all fans of something. People are fans of certain soccer clubs or, or certain celebrities, but fun is a shorter, uh, short version of fanatic or fanatical. And when we look at the word fanatical, well, we would probably say, no, no, I'm not fanatical, I'm just a fan. But uh, we, we commit ourselves to something that we don't mean by using the word that really means something more than we think it does. So being fanatical is being more than, uh, than just enthusiastic about something. It, it's this kind of sick form of um, enthusiasm or support for, for some ideas. So yeah. I believe that uh, when you call something, for instance, social or, or people's democracy, you try to portray something as being good for all people. But uh, there's the concept of weasel words in linguistics. So these are words that attach to other words and they empty them of uh, the original meaning. And if you attach the word peoples to something like people's justice or people's democracy, then it stops being a democracy. People's democracy is not democracy. People's justice is usually not justice. So uh, that's like with the manipulation. Um, I, I think the, the official name for China, right, is like the People's yes. Republic of yeah, China. Exactly. I think North Korea is like a, yeah. something so similar. Poland used to be People's Republic of Poland. Yeah. So that, that's, yeah. that's why that example comes to, 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 to mind. Uh, in Germany, it was the addition of folk. And uh, the only word that survived the, the Nazi time and is still in use is obviously Volkswagen, which was meant as the people's car. Yeah. So, well, I think like... Mm -hmm. I th I think I read that national socialism too. Obviously, it's not socialism, but that that also is like a way to, yeah. I guess, get people you know manipulate the word to yeah, get people. Yeah, the body. word national can also be a, a weasel word. Yeah. Well, what are some of the hallmarks, uh, specifically of Soviet propaganda? Um, well, you we can talk about some of the hallmarks of propaganda in general. But for example, you you write in your book that um, propaganda will often omit verbs. And um, there are other features that propaganda will, will feature. What are some of the hallmarks? Well, omitting verbs is something very specific for propaganda slogans, but we can also probably see it in some advertising. Because advertising takes certain elements of propaganda and uses it too. Uh, Soviet propaganda, I would say Soviet style propaganda, for me it was a, a creative way of talking about reality that was supposed to replace doing things by talking about things. So you could talk about, uh, I don't know, marching towards peaceful future or producing or, or increasing the production of, uh, say, refrigerators. And it created the feeling that something was being done. But, well, what is marching towards peaceful future? Well, you know, are we really marching? Or when we talk about increased production, we assume that something is being produced. If we increase, at least something must be uh, being done. Well, in Soviet propaganda or Soviet-style propaganda, it didn't mean that anything was being produced. It was much cheaper to talk about things than to actually do those things. So a lot of things were just happening on the 
level of language. And yeah. uh, I think it was really interesting how that language didn't fit reality, that language could be detached from reality. I mentioned in the book, another book that uh, really influenced me a lot. It, it's not an academic book, it's a literary book, which I don't think has ever been translated into other languages. It's by a Polish writer, Kazimierz Orłoś, and it's called The Depot, or the place where you store things. And that word, the depot, was used by the alcoholics in a small town to call the uh, drunk tank. And the whole book is written about uh, alcoholics who are being taken advantage of in the drunk tank and uh, about problems of drinking, etc. But it's written in the language of the socialist newspapers where you don't talk about someone being drunk, but you talk about someone about uh, someone under influence. And you don't talk about, uh, uh, I don't know, throwing up in the, in the uh, basement of a building, but about, uh, I don't know, regurgitating the swallowed food in the lower part of the, of the uh, building. So... Uh, the uh, reality that was being described was something that was very well known to people because that was the reality we all saw. But the language was the language of the newspapers and that language just didn't fit that reality. And it was a brilliant way of showing that what the newspapers were writing about had no relationship with the reality that we all saw. So I oh. thought that at one at one hand twisting language or manipulating language can be used for propaganda reasons, but also language or demystifying language, revealing the mechanisms, is a very good way to demolish propaganda. Because once yeah. you start observing those things, you, you realize, well, it makes no sense. And you mentioned this uh, idea of skipping verbs. And the example I use is about... Lenin in October. Lenin in October was a very popular slogan at the time uh, when there were anniversaries of the October Revolution. So the slogan Lenin in October, most people knew it was about the revolution. But someone wrote underneath and cuts in March. And uh, immediately, because you assume that the same verb would be used in both cases, you completely demolish the, the political slogan of Lenin in, in October. So on one hand, uh, by skipping verbs, you are not really saying uh, anything. You say the nation with the party. Well, what is the nation doing with the party? Supporting the party, fighting the party. By noticing those gaps, you are starting to think, well, what are they actually trying to say? It's empty. And yeah. we have the same in Canada. We have those slogans like uh, working together for a better Ontario. Ontario is the province where I live. We used to have those slogans on the roads. Well, what are we? Are we working? Are we planning to work? Who is we? Is it me, the, the, the viewer, or is it the government? So when, when, you, when you start deconstructing those slogans, it just shows that it makes no sense it's like but new and improved in advertising so when you were so when you were growing up maybe a little bit later we were talking about your childhood but maybe teenager or a little bit later i i, I think you wrote you've spent 25 years in uh in poland did most did most people understand that they were being manipulated? Was it an open secret that what you read in the newspaper is is a bunch of baloney? I How think so. At least people I interacted with, I think most people were perfectly aware of it. I, I think it's actually much worse now when we still have a lot of propaganda in Poland. And there are lots of people who believe one side or the other side, and they are uh, almost blind to facts. 
they are being so manipulated by by propaganda. But I think because Poland after the war was pretty much invaded by the Soviet Union, so the communist was imposed, and uh, it wasn't something that Poles welcomed. Uh, my personal experience of living in Poland until 1984 was that I don't really know anyone who truly supported communism, maybe uh, immediately after the war, but not in my generation. Those who supported it were usually people who had benefits from that support. So by joining the party, they could achieve certain things. But I personally, I don't think I actually met anyone who was truly a believer. I, I, I don't think I did. I mean, I knew that certain people said things that they had to say, for instance, in school. Well, maybe my history teacher in, in high school was indeed a believer. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, it, it wasn't like in, in, say, East Germany, where there were people, you know, reporting on each other. I never had that experience. It's not the case that the generation of my parents didn't have that experience because after the war, things were definitely much worse. But I lived in Poland through this last uh, part of the regime when it was not really... I, I don't think people really believed in it. And I guess it should be noted too that Poland is is probably famous for maybe being the most resistant to communism within the uh, within the Eastern Bloc. Well, I'm I'm curious, you know, growing up and and seeing you know being around all this propaganda and um, seeing how language was used. What was it that made you want to study language as a profession? I went into linguistics not by choice. I, As I mentioned, I wanted to be a graphic designer and I wanted to make the world more, more beautiful, but I didn't get into the Academy of uh, Fine Arts. And so I had to make a last minute decision. There were entrance exams to all uh, universities. So I had to make a quick assessment of where could I possibly get in? And uh, with what I prepared for, I decided that philologies were the choices. So it could be the Polish philology, the uh, Russian philology, or the German philology. Those were the three languages that I could potentially study. I dismissed Polish because I didn't see any point I obviously dismissed Russian. I wouldn't go to uh, study Russian. So I chose German. And after two years of studying German, I decided I liked the linguistic side of it more than the liter uh, literature side. And I uh, switched to uh, applied linguistics. And so I became a linguist on a kind of convoluted route. I'm very happy that I did. But it wasn't that I really made a choice to go into linguistics because I was interested in it. And uh, this is very often the case with uh, my students these days. They go to university, they have never heard about linguistics. But when they say first, when they take first year linguistics, they all of a sudden open their eyes and they say, whoa, that's really interesting. So language, it influences the way I think. People in different cultures think somewhat differently or they see the world differently. That was eye-opening for me. And I just loved it. And I'm very happy that, that I didn't get into this Academy of Fine Arts because I probably would have been a pretty lousy designer. But... You know, the, the first time I uh, ever even heard of linguistics was from when I was a teenager. Um I read uh, this book by Dan Brown, the, the guy who wrote The Da Vinci Code. He wrote a, a book called Digital Fortress. And the yeah. hero in this book is a linguist, <laughs> a linguist who like works at the NSA or something like that. And I was like, oh, I've, what is, you know, what is linguistics? What is this? So yeah, it is a, um, maybe not something most people really know about. 
so much. Well, let's 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 talk about once you actually first once you once you leave Poland. I think you write it. It's a little bit strange then for you to look, you know, back and on Eastern Europe and mm-hmm. and see the fall of of the Berlin Wall and and the Soviet Union collapse. Talk about kind of this period right after you leave Poland, and specifically with with the propaganda you're seeing. Maybe it's a lot easier to see it now as propaganda. But what was that experience like with you having immediately left Poland? I left Poland in 1984, and I went to Scotland. And uh, one of the first clashes between my experience in Poland and uh, the the new uh, environment that I was in was that in Scotland there was a very view, very different view of Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher and Ro- Ronald Reagan were uh, very popular political figures in Poland because they spoke very uh, strongly against uh, the uh, martial law, against the communist uh, influences in Eastern Europe. And I was really surprised when all of a sudden I saw that uh, all my new friends, all my instructors were were actually laughing about Margaret Thatcher. That was the time of miners' strikes in Scotland. So Margaret Thatcher was extremely unpopular there. And I remember seeing uh, posters of Ronald Reagan carrying Margaret Thatcher's Thatcher in his arms that were the, the, the version of the Gone with the Wind poster. And it was really eye-opening that one can see the same, uh, the same person, the same historical event from a completely different point of view. Uh, the other uh, really surprising discovery that was more of a historical nature was that all of a sudden Napoleon Bonaparte was a villain. In Polish history, he was a hero because he fought against those who divided Poland, so all the enemies of Poland. So he was the positive character, while in England, obviously, uh, it was Wellington rather than Napoleon. So that was the first time when I began to reevaluate what my my beliefs were about history. I uh, don't think I had to revisit all the history that that I knew, but uh, certainly certain things are black and white when you are in one place, and then all of a sudden you start seeing them in a different uh, light. And uh, that may not be a popular comparison, but it th- this discovery that all of a sudden Napoleon could be seen as a villain and is seen as a villain by most of European countries, uh, except for Poland. Uh, it made one realize that the fact that some Ukrainians were fighting on the side of Hitler was a bit like Poles following Napoleon because that was a chance of of regaining freedom. So history is very gray. It's very rarely black and white, but we usually learn about it in black and white terms. That's so interesting that, that you say that. I remember once I visited Budapest and I was walking um, downtown and I saw a statue. I forget where I was exactly. It was just like a statue of a guy. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And like, I'm getting a little bit closer and like, I'm I'm kind of disregarding the statue. And I think I'm like looking down to my right and the plaque says Ronald Reagan. And I look up and I'm like, oh yeah, I guess that's Ronald Reagan. That's a statue of Reagan here. And that's, that's I didn't actually realize until then that, that I mean, it makes sense obviously because he was very anti-communist, but, but yeah, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan are, celebrated uh, figures in Eastern Europe still to this day. Mm-hmm. I I wonder if if we can talk a little bit about the relationship between propaganda and war. Because I, I, I suppose what I would frame this discussion we're having around the Cold War and Cold War propaganda. Mm-hmm. First, you know, we've 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 gotten 
human beings have gotten much more advanced in how we wage war and how we fight war, and we've become more efficient in a lot of ways in how we do that. I wonder if you would say that propaganda has also evolved when it comes to war. Have we have we gotten better? Have we become better propagandists or more severe propagandists? How would you say propaganda has evolved as it relates to war? I don't know whether propaganda has evolved in linguistic terms. It definitely has evolved uh, from the technological point of view. And I think social media are a a very uh, big tool of propaganda these days. But when I think about uh, war and propaganda, I think that it used to be the case, and it is still the case, that propaganda prepares uh, the war by dehumanizing the enemy. And I think this was the case before, and it is still the case. I recently looked at the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine, and or the Russian invasion, and in some ways, I think that war showed certain lack of preparation in terms of propaganda, in the sense that when you look about how Russians talked about Ukrainians before the war and uh, how Ukrainians talked about Russians, there was uh, n- there is no comparison to the way Germans talked about uh, the Jews. Uh, there was, uh, I, I think there was so much uh, interaction between the two countries. There were lots of Russians living in Ukraine. There were lots of uh, marriages between the two. There was a lot of cooperation in economy. So in many ways, it was more difficult, I believe, for Russians to see Ukrainians as not human. And at the beginning of the war, I thought that because there was not that much hatred, linguistic hatred by name calling, uh, that a peace was possibility was a possibility. But very quickly, the brutality of the uh, Russian invasion really changed that perception. And uh, my son uh, surprisingly went to Ukraine last summer. Uh, He is dating a Ukrainian girl and she wanted to visit uh, her parents. And he said that uh, the perception is, well, the only good Russian is a dead Russian. It's a horrible thing to say, but it just shows that what at the beginning could have been perhaps taken back and there was still a possibility of 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 some kind of uh, reconciliation i think it's gone now and it's a horrible thing because those two nations will be neighbors for the foreseeable future they will have to live next to each other when the war is over and how will they be able to do it unless they find a common narrative, because at the moment they have two different versions of history. And uh, I I think uh, what what I'm interested in in linguistics, for instance, is the idea of apology. For the two sides to to be able to reconcile that there has to be an apology. And I cannot imagine at the moment Russia apologizing to Ukraine, because they would have to admit to what they have done, because part of apology is the statement of what it is that we have done wrongly. So I don't see, from the linguistic point of view, the possibility of communication between the two sides, unless they agree on a common narrative, and unless they apologize. And if you look about the the relationship between Poland and Germany, that has happened in the 1970s. There was an apology, there was a reconciliation between West Germany and Poland. There was never one between East Germany and Poland because East Germans were painted as good Germans, so they had nothing to apologize for. 
obviously the dividing line between the two countries didn't divide Germany into Nazis and not Nazis. So uh, I, I think the the relationship between Poland and East Germany has always been very suspicious. But between Poland and West Germany was surprisingly much better because uh, Willy Brandt came to Poland and he kneeled in front of the ghetto monument and he apologized. So unless something like this happens in Ukraine, there is no possibility of of, of uh, resolving the conflict. So my feeling is that uh, from linguistic point of view, the propaganda hasn't changed that much. But the technological possibilities are much improved. Now, speaking of uh, Russia and Ukraine, are, do, do you see a lot of similarities from when, when you were growing up under communism? Do you, do you see those propaganda strategies being deployed by Russia today um, with the Russia-Ukraine war? Well, I think we, I, I never lived through a war time. So, you know, it, it cannot be compared. Uh, in Ukraine now, uh, people are just dying. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's an actual war. I lived through Cold War. And there were people dying from police brutality, but it wasn't that anyone was dropping bombs on 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 Poland. So I don't think I can I can compare the two. And uh, I I feel that definitely you know this is something that I probably cannot say much about because I just don't know enough about it. But uh, people who say that Russians are brainwashed by Putin's propaganda, that they believe what the TV says. Well, we were being brainwashed by communist propaganda, but people just didn't believe it. And uh, I don't know, maybe because we saw communist propaganda as an imposed propaganda. It wasn't I mean, the communists in Poland were Polish, but the, the, the communism itself was imported from the Soviet Union. But maybe Russians see the war as their own war because it's them fighting Ukraine. But uh, I just don't believe that you cannot get proper information if you want to, even yeah. in Russia today. I just don't believe it. I don't buy it. Do you think that uh, kind of maybe talking out you know a little bit larger than the example of just Russia and Ukraine, thinking about propaganda today, I, su- I suppose what would you say are some of the the more troubling trends that that you are seeing when it comes to propaganda around the globe? From the linguistic point of view, I find the concept of enemy always a very worrisome. And uh, there are elements of uh, portraying someone as enemy that have not changed. Uh, Even when the current Polish government uh, came into power, they ran their, their election campaign choosing as enemy the uh, refugees and the immigrants. And they were using the same expressions that uh, Hitler used in Mein Kampf, talking about uh, dirty immigrants bringing diseases. This is the kind of dehumanizing language where you compare human beings to vermin or to, to parasites. And then the cleansing becomes the issue of hygiene rather than morality. When when you when you try to portray the other side as less than human or something that endangers people in terms of their health or their existence, it's very easy to 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 make people think, well, yeah, we have to protect ourselves. The funny thing about the immigrants and Poland was there there were no particular immigrants who wanted to come to Poland. They maybe wanted to come to Poland to move uh, on to to other European countries. But uh, Poles should have been 
more sensitive because there were huge waves of immigration to other countries from Poland over centuries. And uh, I would think that Poles, more than most other nations, should uh, be sensitive to the problems of immigrants. But even in terms of language used not just in Poland, but in the West uh, in general, you as a linguist will hopefully uh, appreciate it. We very often... I don't know if I call myself a linguist, but uh, I do have a linguistics degree. That is true. (laughs) But uh, when uh, we talk about uh, people trying to enter countries, we now very often use the word migrant rather than immigrant. Just by cutting off this prefix im, when you talk about migrants, they are not people who are escaping war or starvation. They are people just moving between countries for no good reason. And I think by just cutting off this im in immigrant and forming the word migrant, you are just taking away the humanity of those people. You are taking away the only thing they can have to ask for compassion. And And I find it really troublesome how by just doing this, we, we change the perception. And that was something that really made me rethink the whole book when after 9-11, the war on terrorism became the war on terror. It was just cutting off the suffix, but terrorism is something that we can define. It's the activities of certain people who want to dismantle the, the, the world order or whatever, or destabilize something. But terror, what is terror? How can we have a war on terror? How can we win a war on terror? It becomes meaningless. But then it becomes this this abstract idea, this very vague idea, and we can continue this war on terror forever because we'll never win in it. So uh, those little linguistic things are really meaningful. The other example was the Patriot Act. And I can never remember what the full name of it is, but it cannot be a coincidence that it forms the acronym PATRIOT when it's the act of preventing whatever. Uh, You know, those little things that it is your patriotic duty to submit yourself to to, uh, security checks. Well... Your privacy is not a matter of, of, of patriotism. There are certain things that I want to keep private, not because I'm afraid that I'm doing something wrong, but it's just private. What would you say, you know, thinking about, again, because this was a memoir and and kind of putting your own life uh, under the the microscope, thinking about propaganda 40 years ago, as opposed to propaganda now, what do you think has changed? When I was uh, teaching uh, interpersonal communication class, one of the courses I I used to teach, I used to ask my students to write a fear diary. So for three weeks, they were supposed to observe the language use around them and note every day if they have seen anything that they thought was supposed to instill fear in them. And the last time I was teaching that class, for the first time ever, I had a number of students reporting that they no longer know what's real and what's true. And I think this is the biggest change, that uh, I may have been very naive in my evaluation of propaganda, naive in the sense that I thought everything that TV says is untrue, and everything that Radio Free Europe says is true. Well, neither was the case. Some things were true in Polish papers. Some things were not, uh, maybe not untrue, but biased in, in Western media. But at least I could tell what the reality was. And uh, these days, young people very often don't know what uh, the reality is, what's real, what's fake, and how to, how to notice the difference. And uh, I see it even in 
people of my generation, I, I have some of my family on social media and uh, without using names, one of my uh, family members posted something about George Soros, that there, there was a picture of uh, George Soros in a Wehrmacht uniform. And it was a big discovery that George Soros was in in uh, in Nazi army. And I said, well, if you just fact-checked, he was, I think, 15 when the war ended. He couldn't have been in Wehrmacht. And also he was Jewish. He wouldn't be in Wehrmacht. So a little bit of fast-checking would be enough to know. But people are just becoming, I don't know, lazy or or they they accept what they see and there is this confirmation bias they only read what they already know or agree with yeah. so i think propaganda is much more powerful today than it ever yeah. was would you say because of that that attitude now uh, maybe people are more more open to being influenced by propaganda Possibly. It's, it's a very yeah. scary, scary uh, thought. I must yeah. say that when I started, I, I, it took me very long uh, to publish the book because I always did projects with other people and that was just my project. So it was always at the back burner. But uh, I thought for a long time that that book would only have some historical value because the world has changed, especially after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a lot of optimism that uh, now the worst is behind us. But I think these days, it's probably uh, more important than ever to be really vigilant about uh, how we are being manipulated. And uh, maybe, maybe manipulation through advertising is uh, less nefarious but uh, many people say oh i i can see through it i i really cannot be influenced and i'm afraid those are the people who usually let their guard down and they are quite uh, at risk of being influenced just because they don't think it can happen to them they're the ones who get influenced first. Uh, <laughs> well, I uh, I wonder, thinking about, you know, again, because this is a memoir, and thinking about you yourself personally. Now, you did mention this book took you uh, a little bit longer than maybe you had first anticipated to finish. But I wonder how you changed personally from when you started this book to when you finished this book. You know, it's a memoir. You're looking back on your life. You know, you're you're putting things into a perspective maybe you haven't either considered in a long time or or had never considered. But how would you say you changed personally once this book was finished? I don't know. Quite honestly, I don't know whether I, I'm very happy that the book came out. It was uh, a coincidence that I well, I met the publisher of the book many years ago when she was still at McMaster University. And uh, then I did translate a little Ukrainian book that she published as a charitable action to collect money for Ukraine. And uh, I asked her, well, uh, where could I take my book? Because I had the manuscript and I didn't know how to go about publishing it. Because I I know what to do with academic books, but I knew it wasn't an academic book. So I'm very happy that the book finally was published. But uh, I think I became more pessimistic about the world, and uh, I never thought that we'll be in a situation like the one today. I was always afraid of a war with Russia and uh, I was afraid, but I hoped it will never happen. And the fact that the war between Ukraine and Russia started last year, it's something that really made me very sad and very, very pessimistic because it's not a war that can easily end. And I... I'm very much afraid for the world. I, 
I I I wish I wouldn't, but uh, I don't see an easy solution, and I see several more generations of young people being affected by this war and traumatized by this war, both in Ukraine and in Russia. And there are other conflicts going on in the world. And the collective trauma is something that doesn't go away. I must say that many things about me, I only realized when I started to study trauma for academic reasons. And I think uh, societies in post-communist countries are traumatized societies. And uh, some don't know it. And most of them don't think that they can benefit from counseling. But I think without counseling, and by counseling, I mean uh, really orchestrated attempts to heal that trauma. I don't see a solution because part of the trauma is hate and hatred. And there's so much hatred. Uh, one of my interests in the last years is hate speech. And it's... It's really just devastating to read comments in legitimate papers, not just on, on, on social media, where people attack others uh, at personam, where there is just so much toxicity that uh, I don't know what we will do with it, how we will heal the next generations. From it, I think in the States and in Canada, we are quite far away from it, but it doesn't mean that there is no hate. And yeah. uh, I see, I, I, I'm very lucky to be living in Canada. I love Canada. I, I feel very patriotic about Canada, but uh, I wouldn't want to die for it, but I want to work for it. But uh, I'm just really afraid of what's going to happen to the world. Yeah. Well, Magna first, uh, Magda, first, this has been an excellent interview and, and I've loved your answers to my questions. My last question for you is, what are you hoping that readers take away from your book after they read it? I think it depends on the reader. One type of readers that I had in my mind were my children and people like my children. So children of people who left Poland or children of people of my generation. And I want them to understand what we grew up with because it explains a lot of things about us. And uh, I just to give an example, I think that uh, lots of people coming from Eastern Europe are not uh, very fun, uh, very, very uh, supportive of Halloween. And uh, children usually don't understand why parents don't like Halloween. I always liked Halloween, so I, I'm not one of those. But if you grow up in a country where whenever you dig uh, for the foundation for a new building, you find bones from previous wars, the idea of having bones sticking out of uh, grass in front of your house, it's not funny. And it's not just that it's not funny but it just strikes very wrong uh, chords. So I think we have associations because of our upbringing. And so I hope that my children will understand me a little bit better. I hope that other people will understand that uh, communism is not a great system where there were just errors in execution. It's just a wrong system that cannot be run in a better way. I also want people to understand that democracy cannot be taken for granted, that we have to actively defend it, and that we have to stand up for things. And that includes if you see a graffiti that promotes something that you disagree with. You can paint it over or you can go to the janitor and ask them to remove it. But there is no excuse for not standing up for what we believe in. And uh, I believe that nobody has the right 
to force us to do things that we feel are wrong. And uh, this is not obvious that we have the right to do what we feel is right. And we have to stand up for it and defend it because it's very easily lost. Oh, well, a powerful message to end on, Magda. Um, if folks want to stay in touch with what you're working on or uh, the types of work you're putting out, are you on social media? How can people stay in touch with your work? I'm on social media. I mostly post uh, photography because that's uh, what I do for pleasure. But uh, you can read more of my papers on academia and on uh, ResearchGate. Pretty much most of my papers are there. Great. Well, Magda Strowinska, My Life in Propaganda, a memoir about language and totalitarian regimes. Go buy a copy. Go check it out from the library. Um, what a fascinating tale. And uh, Magda, thanks again for your time today. Thank you very much, Anthony.